This could be one of the most important facades built in Britain this century. In 2019, just before the pandemic, a row of modest two to three story terrace houses in Norwich won the Sterling Prize, one of the architecture's highest honors. It is not the tallest nor the most expensive per square meter and definitely not the most extravagant. It's not even in London, not even in central Norwich. So what made this project so successful? What can we learn from it? And has it stood the test of time? The development is a stark contrast to the previous year's winner. The Bloomberg European headquarters, hailed by RIBA judges as a tour de force, had a budget of 1 billion. In comparison, the Goldsmith Street development cost just 17.3 million, which is roughly 3 million cheaper than the staircase in the Bloomberg lobby. More importantly, despite the budget, this building is far more energy efficient, designed to meet passive house standards. In 2022, during the heating bill crisis, this energy efficiency proved very invaluable. Let's examine its facades and explore how energy efficiency was achieved within this budget. One key factor in energy efficient facades is window to wall ratio. Glazing is almost always less thermally efficient than insulated opaque walls. The lower the window to wall ratio, the higher the thermal efficiency. The windows are quite small, yet they appear larger than they are, almost as tall as the doors below. This effect is achieved through the uh, render recesses in the brickwork. But these recesses are not just for aesthetics. They add insulation around the windows, improving the thermal bridges side values. This also simplifies achieving airtight detail at the window frame and the structural opening interface. Another cost-effective fenestration trick is the use of horizontal recesses between the bricks to create the illusion of dummy windows. The mortar in other joints is flush with the brick. However, designers should be very careful with these as they may not be permissible for certain brick type walls. And the recesses should not exceed 10 millimeters. And we will discuss these items in the context of relevant normative documents in the technical review on facade intelligence. Composite windows with triple glazed are used here, achieving a U value below one watts per square meter Kelvin. In these smaller sizes, the windows are as cost effective as they come. But the main energy preserving element is the opaque wall. In this case, it is semi prefabricated timber frame wall with a brick veneer separated by drained cavity. The wall has two thermally broken studs enclosed with OSB boards on either side. Cellulose insulation is blown into the void between the sheathing boards, a cheap alternative to mineral wool, offering comparable thermal resistance. Cellulose in this case is made from recycled paper. It's also cost effective material. A typical external wall might use a timber studs or lightweight steel framing uh, filled with mineral wool. Installing an additional layer of mineral wool outside of the sheeting board would double the labor and require more fixings, making the installation more time consuming and expensive. However, cellulose insulation isn't suitable for every building. It is combustible and may not work with all fenestration layouts. The Goldsmith Street facade is straightforward uh, with orthogonal windows spaced evenly. This allows even filling of the prefabricated timber frame voids, which span only one floor. There is also an issue with insulation settling over time, potentially creating air pockets, which we'll cover in the technical review available on Passat Intelligence. The wall is nearly half a meter thick to meet passive house standards. Since all the insulation is effectively infill, the dew point will inevitably occur within the interstitial spaces. Proper installation of vapor and moisture barriers is crucial which we'll delve into during the technical review. We will also talk about the term bread membrane and why it can be misleading here. A moisture or weather resistant barrier is a more appropriate name. The front elevations are clad in simple stretcher bond brick. This arrangement is effective for placing brick ties, minimizing the thermal bridges and reducing penetrations through the uh, weather resistant barrier membrane, which improves air tightness. The brick is dead loaded at the foundation, thermally broken, and connected to the building laterally through stainless steel ties and lintels above the windows. For buildings taller than three stories, additional masonry support brackets with shelf angles would be needed at each floor, depending on the window layout. Solar shading canopies are installed above south facing windows. These consist of expanded aluminum mesh within rectangular frames fixed to the lintel of the head reveal. This arrangement eliminates thermal bridging as the brick cladding is already thermally broken from the building timber frame. Compare this to the standard bristle detail where the bracket fixed to the backing wall acting as a thermal bridge 
and can cause air leakage by piercing the weather resistant barrier membrane. Our bracket appears stronger than what was installed on this project. This issue was noted by the client as well. To address this, a loading test was uh, conducted on site. The test showed that the frame could break if someone attempts to hang from it. However, the, the way the frame broke made it easy to replace the solar shading. We recommend watching the lecture by the project structural engineer on other structural engineering considerations. The link will be below this video. During our site visit, we have noticed that residents are conducting their own loading tests with uh, suspended planters, small sculptures, and even using the canopies for gardening and cooling of beverages. A key parameter for passive house certification is airtightness. Although the timber frame is partially prefabricated, the structure is predominantly in situ. Achieving airtightness depends on site workmanship and rigorous quality assurance. Designers can influence airtightness by simplifying interface details and minimizing the number of interfaces, giving installers the best chance to achieve robust details. As mentioned, uh, one such design decision was fixing the solar shading to the brick cladding instead of sheeting board. Another smart design choice was placing letter boxes in the side wall of the canopy above the entrance door, rather than placing a mail slot in the front door. Small decisions like these improve the overall air permeability of the building envelope. The facade has many small, seemingly insignificant design decisions that cost little or nothing. For example, positioning rainwater pipes within the masonry cladding movement joints makes them invisible, creating a homogeneous wall appearance. While these details may seem minor on their own, together they create a high-quality design that won one of the architect's most prestigious awards, the Sterling Prize. If you would like to learn more about this case study, check out the technical review on the facade intelligence. We'll cover the interstitial condensation, fire compartmentation, U-values, thermal bridges, glass, movement joints, and brickwork recesses. All 2D details and 3D models, as well as CAD files of the case study, are available on the facade intelligence to members of Institute for Architectural Science and Technology. We will also discuss other important details like accessible thresholds, drainage, door kick plates, and areas that may need improvements such as canopy stains, ironmongery corrosion, and render cracks. IST members will have access to tutorials on brick tie centers, positioning ties in relation to openings and movement joints, timber stud sizes, and considerations for cappings and sills, as well as base details. All these questions will be submitted to the Joint Competence Initiative Peer Review Group and may be included in the baseline competence assessment for relevant roles and areas of expertise. So if you are an architect, project manager, design manager, or a contractor involved in low-rise masonry residential projects, these questions may come up in the future. If you found this video useful, please leave us a like, and if you have any questions, drop them in the comment sections below. And don't forget to subscribe for more educational content like this one.